Good to go? Cool. So um, my name is John McCabe and I'm a premier field engineer based for Microsoft Enterprise Services. Um, my primary goal is to support large scale enterprise customers ranging from five or 6,000 users up to about 450,000 users. So we get to see a, a, a wider range of varying problems and degrees of interesting uh, deployments on, on how people decide and choose to deploy things. But um, in uh, Server 2012 is still relatively new in, in the grand scale of things, so we're going to talk to you a bit about the, the new networking features, and specifically we're going to focus in on a bit more about SMB 3.0, what uh, Aiden was, uh, started talking about before lunch. Um, some new stuff around DHCP, which in my uh, opinion is actually awesome. Uh, it's about time they did it. And um, IP address management, which is version one of the technology, and I will stress that it's version one of the technology. So, you know, forgive us if the demo is a little bit slow and things like this. It's, there, there is a good reason for it. And then we're going to talk about some of the new stuff in Direct Access 2012. Okay. And if you are reading that thing, I'm glad you're paying attention. I really am. It's always difficult just after lunch. So first of all, we'll do a quick recap on what's new in terms of networking and what's uh, updated in uh, Server 2012 because they've made quite a serious investment in some of the features. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see straight away um, between data center bridging, Hyper-V network virtualization, a lot of stuff around low latency really driving down the network and stacks so that we can uh, perform exceptionally well on the network. New stuff about direct access, quality of service. Uh, the quality of service stuff was greatly in, uh, improved in 2012. And then we've got new support for 802.1x wired and wireless authentication, which is really, really cool. Uh, EAP TTLS, um, new, new protocol that we support. DNS SEC, although it's around in 2008 or two, uh, there's a few more extensions and bits and pieces to 2012. And one of the interesting things I, I suppose I took from MMS when we were over there was uh, we were shouting and screamed at why we weren't using DNS sec in our enterprises today because it keeps DNS secure. So it's an interesting thing. Stuff we're going to talk about in more detail though is uh, the DHCP failover and the policy-based assignment. And I really like the idea of policy-based assignment. I'm going to show you a quick demo later on. Uh, NLB, a little bit improved in 2012 and some more stuff with uh, Windows Firewall. Now we're not going to talk about all these features, but all I'm trying to show you is this is the amount of stuff that we've worked on. There's a lot more that we've worked on in 2012. Uh, following on from key messages this morning, if you haven't already deployed it in a test lab or your data center, it is really now time to start looking at it. Uh, forget the end of life support for the products. Um, this thing is a game changer for your, for your data center. So SMB3, and we're just gonna do a quick kind of recap on what, uh, some of what Aiden uh, talked about and maybe go a little bit deeper in certain cases. So we'll just bring them all up. So Aiden talked about the transparent failover. Uh, we have a quick slide on that. Really important feature in 2012. Imagine giving zero downtime, uh, being able to take a server offline, zero downtime, a server fails, not losing network communication, um, providing like decent access for your SQL databases, your Hyper-V machines, which are exceptionally <laughs> time sensitive. Imagine being able to do all this on a file server. I think it's pretty impressive, uh, personally, but we'll, we'll go into it. SMB multi-channel, and we're just gonna quickly recap around, around this for a second. SMB direct or SMB over RDMA remote desktop, or remote direct memory access, uh, we'll have a quick chat. And then some of the specific performance optimizations of why, we're allowed, why we can actually do this and what, I, what why it allows. So, <coughs> excuse me. Multi-channel support, RDMA, directory op locks, the clustering capability and the create operational support. All these things combined obviously will give you fantastic stuff when inside 2012, but specifically multi-channel support, we talked about multiple NICs being able to aggregate the bandwidth over a couple of different NICs. I mean, realistically, do you get a gig of bandwidth on your network when you're given a one gig NIC? No, you get maybe 60, 70% of it that you're able to utilize. Now take 10 of those and you get 60% uh, across 10 different NICs. Imagine how much bandwidth you're gonna throw at your networks. <coughs> an awful lot more. Or do you may support, uh, we have a slide that will go deeper into this, but specifically, as, we, as, as Aiden said, it's a memory to memory copy between the servers, bypassing all the lovely Windows OS layer and going directly to the hardware, fantastically fast. 
directory uplocks. So anyone who remembered uh, interesting database applications, that opportunistic locking um, and how much fun it was caused uh, when you had to support the application. We can now, specifically it was used for caching to help the, to help the file system along. Now we can actually take into account an entire directory rather than just a single file, um, given greater performance. Clustering capability with the scale out file service that Aiden was talking about. I don't really need to go into more details. I think you got the point to the demo that you can have your eight file servers now, one goes down, no access is lost um, between a few different things. Yeah. Yeah, at the minute. Well, you can stretch VLANs, but it gets complicated. So, and then again, you're worrying about your storage pools and then uh, your, your latency back to your storage pools. So, just a, a recap on this particular diagram. So, users accessing the file share, the node fails over to fail over B, and within a specified period of time, generally it's under 60 seconds. Um, it's written around kind of latency between uh, what Hyper V and SQL actually will support in terms of how long it will take for that to re register an application failure. The guidelines say about 25 seconds inside the documentation, so it's not so it's it's pretty quick. But pretty much, some of the stuff that Aiden was saying, like you have your two you have your two servers, your initial client will make a connection to file server node A. It will then negotiate its witness to file server node B. If file server node A goes down within a specified period of time, in background logic, I say it's within sort of 25 seconds, the IOs will queue and then get replayed and rewritten to node B with zero loss. So that's pretty cool. <coughs> this is just about the, the multi-channel and specifically, we're just saying aggregated NICs. So the more you can aggregate, the better. There's something tomorrow that we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit, well, I, I'm not sure if myself or Aiden are gonna talk about it, but it's conversion networks, um, probably Aiden. Uh, and, and specifically a why now, rather than having like when, when you design your clusters or your Hyper-V clusters, you needed 10 NICs or 12 NICs and you needed to do teaming and on the hardware with supported NICs and all sorts of wonderful stuff. Well, now we're get, getting away from this where you can potentially do with conversion networks, two NICs, S and B multi-channel, lots of really good fun stuff um, for mass amount of things. We're gonna demo a quick later on about S and B multi-channel. And it's just to show you a simple file copy and how it uses the three individual NICs automatically. I don't have to do anything. And we can disable one and it will auto detect. One of the things that um, Aiden mentioned as well was the receiver side scaling about being able to split the load across multiple cores on the CPU. Uh, it's really important because the CPU then, if you didn't have RSS and it's not so, we don't support L, uh, SMB multi-channel unless you have an RSS enabled NIC or, or DMA. Um, where you'll always have the one core in your CPU as a, as a bottleneck. So it's things like this you just need to take into account when you're looking at it. Um, again, one of the things uh, was mentioned in the previous presentation was really look at the hardware compatibility list. It's there for a reason, it's not there for fun and games. We don't just create support statements uh, for, for, for people to laugh at and think, yeah, I'm gonna ignore that and do something else. They're there for a reason, they're tested, they're well-defined, so please pay attention to them, as I will always continue. Some of the things you're gonna see later on in the demo is again, the automatic detection. Zero configuration. How many people love taking a server and spend six hours configuring a server just to do one basic? Yeah, that's my point. You don't, we don't like to configure. We wanna take as much, uh, as much configuration away as possible. We don't want you to become rocket scientists just to be able to deploy a single feature. It doesn't make sense. So that's where we come with, with a lot of our automatic detection. Transparent recovery, fantastic. You don't need to do anything again. Even better. All going back to the to the financial argument uh, that was used earlier on again, saving time, saving money if you deploy this particular piece of software. SM, uh, SMB Direct. Uh, one of the things I just want you to really pay attention to is between the user and the, <coughs> the, the user and the kernel mode, and see where the actual audio may actually happens. So you'll see it happens really, really, really low on the hardware, and that's really kind of important because a we need to have certified hardware and not Mickey Mouse stuff that people will write bad drivers for because it will crash your hardware if you don't use it properly or if you don't use supported vendors. But the point being is it's very low on the stack right next to the hardware so you're gonna get maximum performance as you can out of that actual system. RDMA should only be used really for storage transactions as well. Um, 
and that's really important. So like if, if you have multiple, um, like if you have a server that's RDMA capable, you, you will probably end up putting uh, additional NICs in to serve like your virtual machine traffic. You wouldn't run them over your RDMA NICs, just back to your storage you would, that's all. You wouldn't run the client VM traffic. <coughs> Some of the performance optimizations that we want to uh, quickly. So sort of one of the first things we did was small random read write IO. So really small packets because that's the way SQL works. Um, exchange, the, the exchange database architectures, which isn't supported on uh, scale out file servers, went for sequential IO in 2012, uh, 2010. And as far as I remember, they've carried that model to 2013. So it's a little bit different, but because SQL, you've never, you have no idea what way the transactions are going to come. They've run the, the smaller the packets, the quicker it's going to query, the quicker it can get in, the quicker it can get out. So they rewrote SMB3 to, sum to support small random I.O. The second thing that they did was they introduced the large MTU by default. Does everyone know what an MTU is? Maximum transmission unit. Ethernet is like 1,500 bytes. Uh, so that means you can only send 1,500 bytes across the network at any one time. Large MTU, and forgive me, I don't have the exact number of what the large MTU is. Does anyone know what the large MTU is? 9,000. 9, there you go. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's at 9,000, so it's a good few times bigger, about four times bigger, roughly, isn't it? Six. Six? Six Sorry, yeah, 1,500. Oh, there we go. So again, I can't do maths either, apparently. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so the larger the MTU, the faster something can copy over the network. That's the, ho that's the entire point. So that's why you'll see that why we can achieve the same sort of uh, uh, capabilities and performance as a nice cozy SAN, if not better, especially if you aggregate the NICs properly. So I'll just do a quick demo, and hopefully, like the others, uh, the demo gods are good to us. So just, uh, just quickly what you'll see here is, oh, uh, is just, sorry. Here we go. So what we have here, so we, we, I've basically created two servers. Uh, literally, I've just, they're sysprep servers. There's nothing special about them. They've got three particular NICs on them. One gigabit, uh, or well, 10 gigabit if, you, if, you, if you're talking internal to the VM. But if you look in here, you'll, you'll pretty much see. Uh, Network control panel uh, details. So nothing specific, and if you go into the individual VMs, you'll actually notice uh, are they're all DHCP configured. So absolutely a zero configuration, the laziest possible setup I could come up with. All right? Brutally honest. So they all have individual IPs, and just to prove that they actually do have individual IPs, uh, we'll do this. So you see there, they're, so they're all issued from a DHCP server. Nothing special. So quite literally, 15 minutes to spin up a sysprep v v VHD, a um, couple of minutes to create a, uh, a VM, a couple of minutes to add, a dis or add the three NICs and then power up the VM and join it to the domain. So absolutely zero. Now what we got here uh, is we got a file share, and hopefully it's still there. I don't even have a file share. I just literally have <coughs> a single ISO image, three gig, that I'm going to copy across to the second file server. What I'm going to do is, what I want you to do is pay attention to these particular three segments here. So the idea of multi-channel is that it will automatically, with zero configuration, with zero touching it, be able to throw and load balance across those partic three particular NICs, rather than just one. So you're all familiar with the, the one. Um, and we fixed the copy algorithm in, in 2012, didn't we? Well, it reports better and the, the, the infinite amount of time. So just, for example, I'll just copy over to FSO2. Um, nothing particularly special. I'll just copy it in here. So what you'll see straight away, it's not teamed, not anything special, but the NICs are being load, it's being load balanced across the three NICs straight away. Zero configuration. Cool? Useful feature in your data center? I hope so. If you decide to disable one of those NICs, if I'm quick enough, <coughs> if 
doesn't matter. Still copy. Still happen. It'll just split the loadout over now. It'll take a couple of seconds to renegotiate all those bits and pieces and auto configure, but it still happens. Now, I don't think I'm going to be quick enough to add it back in, but. <coughs> yeah, there you go. But it's still, you could see at the last second it started retrying to load bounds out towards the Trinix. So, very simple, very powerful demo of what um, SMB multi channel actually is. And as I say, 20 minutes, bar the migration of your file data, you can actually have an SMB file server up and running pretty damn quickly. Okay. Uh, make sure I press the right button, otherwise I have to go through all of them again. Any questions on that? I would still do, the, it'll find it once the IPs, like, so what happens between the initial setup of the actual SMB, there's a negotiation that goes on and it will figure out whether it can actually do it between the servers. It's the same with the Skylar file server is when it makes an initial connection, it'll figure out that there's a property set to say, I'm a Skylar file server, thank you very much, and away it connects. No, it, it, again, it'll all negotiate between the two servers and see what's capable. It has to be a server 2012 host or, so it has to be server 2012. Impressed? Smile then, it's good.